podcast that you listen to after binge listening, which is totally a thing, uh, Taiwanese death metal. Um, I'm Chris, Jazz Sequence on the internet. I'm joined as per usual by Binary Gary, who's Gary in real life, and Allison, who is Allison on the internet. Asparagus? Yeah, we can touch on that in a minute. Cool. Uh, this is a show where, uh, I mean, you can find us online, Binary Jazz at us. There's other stuff of how to get in touch with us. Basically, somebody comes up with a topic, usually it's Allison, and presents it to uh, Gary and I, and we have no idea what it is in advance or just in general. And we then spend uh, most of the Zoom call uh, trying to describe what it is and also getting sidetracked by other things that that's inaccurate really it is thing. definitely not most yeah <laughs> and uh and then yeah when we just i guess fuck around for 10 minutes when after the at the end because we have listener questions we would listen we, we would we would read your listener questions on on the air is would love a listener question over over the air in on the internet we would read your listener questions if you're on the line Instead, most of the time when we do get feedback, we end up reading spam, which is okay too. So, not as it, cool. like very, very worth noting, this is not a scripted show. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, I think we'd still was, be. If this was our effort, if this was the script. <laughs> this is maximum effort. <laughs> hey. I don't know that I'd be into it. Like, I feel like that's, I mean, there are podcasts that are scripted and produced, but I generally like a podcast where someone shows up and I'm like, well, I've got a microphone, perhaps some notes. Let's just see where it goes. Maybe even a clock. In our case, we have a clock that we don't look at until it's like, hey. Until it's too late. I'm about to shut you off, yeah. The clock yeah. is actually a feature. It's like sort of a speed chess where we each have a certain amount of time and then once we use it up, it's just like, that's that. We... <laughs> Like four minutes in, Gary's muted. Sorry, you're out of time. Damn yeah. it. Uh, happened to you have week. Your stories <laughs> besides people. Do you want to hear about asparagus? I, 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 read, I read your Twitter thread. Yes. Um, but I, I think it was just two I tweets. I guess I, I just don't understand why it was asparagus and not like asparagary or something that like rhymed more or like. I don't know. I was in high school and dumb. Yeah. So Chris, here's the deal. I had this teacher in high school, uh, Miss Piernick is her name. I can't remember her first name. I, maybe I never knew it. Um, wonderful out, health Pierce, teacher. One of our most loyal listeners. <laughs> right. Assuming she's still with us. Uh, I wasn't that long ago. I was in high school. She must be. Um, although she seemed ancient at the time. She probably wasn't. She was probably, probably like in her 30s. <laughs> 30s. Yeah, I know. But I was in high school. So anyway, uh, she, um, uh, the first day of class, she was like, does anybody have any nicknames? And like the class was silent. She's like, really? Nobody has nicknames? Everybody always has a nickname. Like Michael, Mike goes by Mike. Like still like crickets. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm a smart ass. So what's your nickname? I go by asparagus. So she writes that down in her book and, uh, and God bless her. Because then for the rest of the semester, we didn't have much homework, but when we did, I had to hand it in with asparagus Kovar written down on it. Uh, and then like whenever we had substitute teachers that would take role, because Ms. Piernick, of course, knew us, so she just went down the role sheet, but, you know, they'd be like, uh, you know, Jimmy Calhoun or whatever, Asparagus Kovar, and like, that was the thing. So God bless Ms. Piernick. She was like, hey, smart ass, come on, I've been this a while, bring it. So I, I had to go buy asparagus for a semester because I was a smart ass. So I good. I appreciate the commitment and I appreciate her doubling down and being like, all right. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. I, and there I laugh are probably about it often. so few things that bring a, a teacher joy uh, just in general with, with like so much pressure that's put on them and like, you know, trying to get these kids to, to actually learn a thing or two yeah. that, that uh, demanding one of your students be, re be known and referred to as asparagus has to be up there with like, you know, top. I disagree though. Like, because in her case, she was just, she, like, you could tell she took joy in teaching. Like she loved the kids that were smart asses and she, you know, I mean, there were, there were no trouble. I can't remember the time in her class where like someone got thrown out of class, which wasn't like in my school, like 
people got thrown out of class pretty often. I got thrown out of class pretty long, pretty often. Um, but she, I mean, she just, you know, like if the class was feeling mayhem that day, well, she harnessed that mayhem and we still learned stuff. And I guess in health too, you always have the option of like, all right, let's tone it down. Or I'm showing gross pictures again. <laughs> that's, that's always the threat. Right. So I don't know that she wielded that very much. Um, but I mean, like she had us all singing about like, um, how to identify cancer warnings. I mean, she was great. She really, really brought game for a class that should have been miserable and uh, made it made it good. So shout out to Miss Piernick. Yeah, I hope that she is listening to you today. From your favorite produce student. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you eat asparagus? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had it uh, two nights ago. We had it uh, as a side. And then uh, the next night we had quiche with asparagus in it. So two days back to back. I love asparagus. We're not doing eggs. And I feel like yeah. most quiche is difficult, but I haven't tried Tofu. it. Tofu. But yeah, they're not like our house and dietary restrictions. It's just like, <laughs> you, get, you, can't do, you can't do tofu because soy? I, yeah, I'm just not, I'm supposed to watch my soy intake, which I mean, could I can watch it rise, I guess, yeah. is also one way of looking at that. Yeah, it's like watching, like observing it or is like limiting it. I, I feel I, like watching is like a pretty broad <laughs> mandate. Not, it's not like a, a hard no. It's, it's more just like, just be careful that you're not having it for every meal and it's not your sole protein and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, um, yeah that would be a lot. Yeah, I didn't think about quiche being like egg. So oh, it's sadly, delicious. It's like egg and cheese. It's just all the good things. Yeah, and it is yeah, in a pie things. crust. Like it's so. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm assuming cool someone was like, "Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> for sure." I'm, I'm assuming the person that came up with it was like, "Damn, you know, it'd be good a breakfast pie." <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, pie, that's kind of a comfort food. Anyway, pie for breakfast is is okay in our house. Yeah. I'm down with that too. Key lime I mean, usually, pie. Usually pie is great like, breakfast you know, food. Like there's pumpkin pie. Pumpkins are pumpkins are healthy. Or there's or it's like a fruit pie of some variety. And fruit is healthy. And it's just yeah. I mean, what what's the what's the the it's contextual less sugar difference? Than what's the contextual cereal. difference between yeah, exactly, between pie and like, I don't know, uh, a breakfast uh baked good of some other variety, like Mm -hmm. a jelly donut or something hey man you know, first, you know, a pie is me. basically a breakfast cereal yeah because it's in a bowl yeah which is oh, a edible bowl not only <laughs> yeah. is it in a bowl it's 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 like a it's it's better environmental stewardship because i'm eating the bowl yeah not only not only have you convinced me but now i'm going to have pie tomorrow for breakfast or perhaps after this call i may have to go acquire a pie actually we're just going grocery shopping hang on and you get pie <laughs> Yeah, we, we make a, a vegan quiche, but it is a lot of tofu. And is it like the silken tofu? No, we just blend it. We use our, okay. our high-speed blender and blend that with, uh, blend the tofu with like stuff uh, to make okay. it, yeah. Also tofu. And asparagus. <laughs> I think we still have some asparagus. I don't know why I looked at my phone for asparagus, but I'm pretty sure we still have some. I, I feel like we should throw in something else random for Rhonda to get, just to throw her off the scent. <laughs> I, I, uh, I really expect to hear back, like uh, either it's already on the list or, or what? Yeah. <laughs> One of the two. For what nefarious purposes do you need to buy? <laughs> yeah, or, or, or perhaps what kind? But I'm, I'm actually less interested in that. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're like, look, just the one that looks the best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, go with what movie. Like, uh, you know, I don't know. Whatever's, whatever's in bloom. Whatever's in bloom. Yeah. Because pies bloom. It's like a pie tree. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I think I famously have said several times that winter kicked my ass. And I was so thrilled when things started blooming here. Uh, that will continue to be a theme, I guess, because I'm about to talk about it again. So the azaleas, we have uh, pink and white azaleas that have just been like amazing. 
I'm not a flower guy. I just, I don't, I don't even know how to name flowers generally, but these, I like look at them and I'm just like enamored by these things. These bushes, they're just so vibrant. And previously were just green and just exploded. And they're, I mean, they're, it's like the whole bush that you can't even see like where the green was. It's great. Um, so uh, I, I've taken that as like a phrase that I use, like, you know, like referring to things in bloom, just this, like, I don't know, like, I, it feels like a word that means different things to me now than it did yay 45 days ago <laughs> it is it has movement it has like like direction and growth it's it's uh yeah it's because, it's definitely more than just like oh it's blue is that because uh things have is that because uh north carolina has seasons perhaps oh perhaps yes i'm i'm actually certain that's what it like the the flowering dogwood has flowers are you fucking kidding me right now? It's so good. It's so good. A lot of those, a lot of those uh, blooming trees too. Like they bloom early, and then that's it. That's their thing. That's the thing they do for the whole year. Yeah. Yep. That's Catch what it now. Does. Yeah. We when we moved in here in July, uh, the dogwood was there, and you could see like little buds or whatever. And so I, I frantically googled. I'm like, when does this thing bloom? Right. Uh, and we found out like you know April May. We're like, damn it, we missed it. So this, this kind of, I mean, I, I won't say it's been circling the calendar, but it's just right outside the kitchen window. So we often have this discussion, like, I can't wait till that thing blooms. And so now, like when it started, there were like two or three, and it was, I mean, it was like, a, have you looked at the dogwood like this afternoon? <laughs> it was like that, that often, that thing. We have, um, uh, our, our apricot tree has branches that go right in front of our bedroom window. Um, so like, hmm. when that's blooming, we can just look outside and, 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 the thing is that none of us in this house really like apricots. So, <laughs> so, and, and apricot trees are, are really early bloom, at least ours have been. So like we kind of subverse, subvert, sub, subversive, subversively mm -hmm. hope uh, that like it's pretty and it's bloom. We like to see it bloom, but then we hope for like a really early freeze or a really late freeze, I guess, uh, to kill all the flowers so that it doesn't actually turn into apricots. Like, give us the flowers and then, like, snow and kill all the apricots. <laughs> oh, my God. That's perfect. Because <laughs> it happened, it happened, like, because the first year we were here, like, we got tons and tons of apricots. And, like, we don't pick them because we don't want them. Uh, nobody mm. else picks them. And so the squirrels pick them. And then they just drop these apricot bits and pieces onto the deck. And it's really nasty. And then it sits out in the heat, especially in the summer. And it's just gross. Um, so you need to pick them one way or the other, even if you're not going to eat them, which is like really like a pain in the ass to do if you're not going to eat them. Um, so yeah, so one year uh, we got far less of an apricot harvest because it snowed uh, after it bloomed and you're like, that's the thing, that's the thing, that's, that's what should happen every year. Do you have, um, here there's like a, a nonprofit that will go around basically picking fruit for you? I don't know. Oh, I, and like yeah. basically what they do is they have volunteers and if you have fruit trees or whatever that you just need care and someone to take care of them and then they'll pick and they'll give you a third the volunteers that pick them get a third and then they donate the last third to a food bank um and yeah but i'm sure it's so cool anyway yeah it's, i i really like it because i have a few friends that have either fruit tree like it's a, it's a you know a gift and a curse because even if you like the fruit, it's like way too much of one thing for like one family often. We will so. use, we will use the the apples we get from the apple tree. One way or another, we will use them. Um, yeah. But like we have, we have like a pear tree. None of us really like pears. Although I decided, I decided last year uh, that we should just pick the pears and dry them like uh, dried pears. Mm -hmm. um, Cause we do that with a lot of the apples. Like whatever we don't actually eat of the apples, we can just dry them. Um, we don't have our own dehydrator that was on, on the list of things to get this year um but we will do that uh and then you mean if i send dehydrators i used to sell dehydrators i have lots of opinions <laughs> i will ping you about dehydrators uh happy to chat to dehydration and uh and we have another apricot tree we used to have another wait we, yeah we have one pear tree and i think we have another pear tree and then we also have another apricot tree but those two don't the other extras don't produce as much but we do get we usually get some pears and we get hopefully lots of apples our apples are really really small so they're not like you know they're like like somewhere between like a crab apple and like a just a normal 
but small like granny smith sort of thing have, have we uh hit topic today no no i have a topic i think uh, it's uh, the topic time topic time um the topic which i'm not quite sure if i'm pronouncing right but i've been pronouncing it as Haram. Okay, now that I've confused myself. Haram, Haram Mickey. Yeah, there we go. Haram Mickey. Spell that for me, please. H I R A M E K I. H I R A M E K I. Yeah. Wow. It could also be Hirameki. I just feel like Haramiki sounds better <laughs> mm -hmm. it looks japanese in nature it looks japanese yeah yeah mm. in which case oh it would, did you see that chris it, we said that Hirameki. and she gave a knowing glance it is I, not japanese this I is didn't see that rugs getting pulled under out from under us today watch out i didn't say anything though <laughs> speed bump yeah and i don't know about pronunciation because i've only seen it written so well, if it's, if it's Japanese, you pronounce all of the vowels in the same way all the time. So it would be Hiramiki. Hiramiki. Tyler and I had this conversation the other day about... Hiramiki. Um, uh, about oh, he About mispronouncing words. Uh, and I said, like, he, he said something and I, I corrected pronunciation on it. He's like, man. I'm like, dude, like, if you learned that word from a book and never heard it pronounced, like, like where that is a badge of honor that you have all these like this great vocabulary because of your reading that's rad so yeah aaron i also aaron, mispronounced aaron and, still and continue i are to. watching aaron and i are watching well i'm watching critical role with aaron and matt mercer pronounces a lot of things incorrectly because obviously he's only ever heard those words or read those words and not heard them out loud because it's like obscure words that you wouldn't hear out loud because it's like uh now I need to think of something and I'm not going to. Um, but it's the sort of things that you would read in fantasy books. Like you just, you read it, but you don't hear it. Um, and uh, and it always, she always rolls her eyes and then like makes fun of him because she's very, uh, very attentive to everything like that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I her. So I like to, I like to rub it in a little bit too. It's good. Uh, but here, Mekki, um, uh, is a, uh, I would say, uh, second dynasty composer. Uh, no, a, sort of a, a multi-talented uh, individual uh, who um, uh, wrote poetry and, uh, uh, and painted and composed uh, uh, songs uh, in, in early dynastic Japan. Also, it's a, a uh, yeah, yeah. It's actually a uh, kind of construction adhesive. <laughs> Comes in a tube, you pipe it out, put your uh, whatever you need on it, adhese it, it to the floor or the wall or whatever. Add here, adhere it. That's the word. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was in there somewhere. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, also a tasty sandwich filling. Doubles down there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the taste. Sounds like sort marshmallow. Of like, sort of like a Nutella it's kind of thing. Yeah. Saltier. Yeah. Fish paste. It's, it's a savory. It, it, it resembles fish paste, but is completely uh, animal free. <laughs> it's vegan, uh, right? Seaweed. Seaweed. Seaweed paste. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. That sounds horrific, doesn't it? so bad put it yeah. on your tofu you put it on your tofu sandwiches seaweed paste <laughs> mm. I, had mm. a, I had a friend in high school who uh who is becoming a vegetarian in high school and her mom didn't know what to do with that information and so uh was attempting to make her a sandwich one day and just literally like two slices of bread and a slice of tofu <laughs> was the sandwich and she's like uh <laughs> what <laughs> comes from a place of love but yep there <laughs> tofu sandwich 
that. <laughs> I'm thinking about that and imagining like, okay, I put a tofu sandwich and Cheez-Its in your lunch because I didn't want to give you goldfish crackers. Like, <laughs> it's just like, it's almost like, okay. all right. It's just not, not quite there. You could put the Did not stick the landing. You could put the Cheez-Its in the sandwich. That would be, that would be something. Oh man, yes. Potato chips of any sort, like in a sandwich. Oh, salt and vinegar potato chips in a sandwich. Or a nice Are you addition. gonna ask Rhonda to get a salt and vinegar potato chips now? Nope. Do you already nope. have them? Nope. No, nope. I'm fine imagining them. I'm just gonna throw some pickles on the sandwich today. I'm fine with imagining them. I'm, I've never been hugely into the salt and vinegar chips. I got more into them when I was in England because it was more of a thing. And also, there's very strange, well, how long were you strange in England? To, uh, a semester. So, like five months. Got five it. Five months. Okay. Um, long enough to adapt to some of the uh, behaviors, I suppose. Uh, yeah, like I started calling my pants trousers, and that was it. <laughs> Uh, I didn't wear anything other than you, jeans, so that was pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. Were you uh, were you vegetarian then? I was going back and forth at the time. Um, and while I was in England, I was in a back... No, I was in a fourth uh, period where I was no longer vegetarian. Uh, but then okay. I, I, I kind of bounced back sometime after that. So did, I, I, really where I'm going with this is do you get fish and chips? Yeah. 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 And the verdict? Excellent. Yeah. All right. Would do. Yeah. yeah. 10 10. Yep. Would recommend. Yeah. Are you pro or anti fish and chips, Gary? Oh, pro. pro. I, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of like fish in general, all kinds of fish. Charlotte likes salmon a lot. There, there is. Oh, okay. Something the thing that I learned while I was there, I mean, it, was, it, it would have been really difficult to be vegetarian there. I think I, I think I figured that out like within the first couple of weeks and I was like, well, this is going to be a problem. So whatever, I'll just do it and then I can switch back later or something. Um, and I wasn't like, I was in the, I was in the, uh, if I don't see how it's made, then it's okay to eat phase of my mm. uh, vegetarianism. Mm. Sure. Um, so like things like ground meat, so hamburgers and like sausage and things or things like, I don't have to think about like how those things, like the animal that it comes from, cause I don't see it in front of me. So I'm just going to just pretend that that stuff doesn't exist and just eat the thing. Um, it's and from the sausage tree. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and like meat pies and, uh, like sausage right next to like things. vines of Dyson spheres. <laughs> Me meat pies and, 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 uh, sausage pastry things, meat pastries were, are a big deal, uh, frequently yeah. found in like the open market stuff. And yeah. I, I had a thing for, um, meat pies when I was working at, uh, at web dev, like that was my lunch. A lot of I'm not sure why. I would get like frozen meat pies. I guess because they were cheap and they were, I don't know, whatever. I loved sitting on the porch and having a meat pie when it was like 100 degrees outside. I don't. That's maybe the one thing that working remotely doesn't let you, I don't know, that I, not that I miss, but that like I like scoping out other people's lunch choices. And so mm -hmm. like I miss that experience when I work. Were you there at WDS when I created the lunchroom, but I did it with the wrong prefix and then it couldn't be changged? No. Or no, I did something silly, and I, I it was like I did it with like an underscore instead of a dash or vice versa, whichever it was, and I I kind of intentionally did it wrong because, you know, mayhem's fun, um, but but then like in Slack like you couldn't rename it to replace the slash or the dash with the underscore or vice versa like it was broken, so, like whenever Brad would mention that room he would mention that Gary broke the, the channel name and it couldn't be fixed. Uh, I'm not sure he was actually like upset about it, but I, I do know that he really appreciated that it was broken and wanted everyone to know that I was on the broke it, which was fine. I mean, it's, it's actually accurate. What was the purpose of the lunchroom? Was it just a place to chat? To, sh to show pictures of your lunch, like literally that, like here's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich I made. <laughs> I, I often was like the only voice in there for days at a time. 
um, which I was fine with because that also, like, there were times where I, I would like copy and paste the photo from the previous day if I was doing leftovers, you know, just because I thought it was I, I enjoy like, like keep Gary happy, give him like give him an empty channel he can talk to himself apparently. I mean that's that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the guy that like you know how to keep a dummy busy, turn it over like six or seven times. All right. In fact, uh, coincidentally, here a Mechie uh, actually means an empty room in which you talk to yourself. That's what it means. Um, I have um, problems with um, reverb, not me personally, but like listening to reverb. Like <laughs> it really bothers me when there's an artificial reverb. And I, I, I mean, I feel like you can't do music without putting some in there because like just dry sound is like, Ooh, that's a bit too honest, you know? Uh, like every instrument and voice, maybe not every, but damn near every instrument and voice. Um, but then like, if you apply like reverb, there's a point where it's like, oh, that's too much. But you pull back and you go, that's a bit too honest. Like there's not, there's actually not a line. There's not a balance that works. And I, I don't feel, I don't think it's possible. That's I'm fascinated that's, by your, your phrasing of too honest. <laughs> Um, like too crisp or too no like too honest like you like like it like like someone takes like a photo and you look at the photo in the hallway you're like oh that's great but like you don't like walk up to it and like look at like the blemishes on someone's face like you know like it's i, I don't want to say it's too zoomed in but it's like a little like maybe we could have photoshopped that a bit or just don't stand so damn close like that's <laughs> Yeah, I honest, I, I I feel like it. I feel like, but there's there's a point for that. So I like when when recording, I like a very honest sound because you can hear it, listen to a take, and be like, oh yeah, that'll work. Or no, that's not going to work. Like we need to get that again because there's that weird thing that's not going to line up with, you know, like you went flat or well, we could fix that or like that. I don't know that part, like that little glitch in your voice or whatever it was is fine, but that one's not. So we got to redo that thing, you know. Um, and I, and I feel like having an honest mic makes that super easy, but then you don't actually want it to be that honest in the mix because you want it to blend and fit in and, and reverb is like, I think the natural place everybody goes. And I mean, of course it is. I mean, where you, you're not used to listening to someone like right up, like, you know, actually was that the microphone? Was it? Was yeah. That, that you was hear a difference? Okay. That was definitely, that I wasn't cool. sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, well, yeah, so you're not used to people being like right there, like in your ears, so close. And, and so that reverb gives it space, but, but it also is manufactured. That's what it is. It's manufactured space because the space wasn't really there. We're approximating this container that didn't exist. I, you're a Mecky. <laughs> I don't have that problem uh, yeah. nearly as much. And I feel like it's because the music that I make is manufactured. Because I, but there's, I, but I mean, you yes. added, you added, to, you added synthesizer too, but it's a totally different thing if you add it to synthesizer, because yes. you, then you're doing it to just give it some room. Then you're just giving it to like to make to, for for the manufactured space. Um, but a lot of the stuff I do, like I don't, I, I maybe I don't put, I don't necessarily put reverb on everything. Why would I? Some things have it, like some things sort of have a resonance that is similar to reverb like as part of the sound um but yeah i think it's i think it's equating it to like like if i think about like a brass instrument like a trumpet and think about like when a trumpet stops like it doesn't just stop like the sound doesn't just stop right like it it but when it an has 808 to finish stops, when an 808 stops it stops stops i know <laughs> but but i yeah so maybe it is maybe it is recording physical uh, you're right because like synthesized music like yeah of course like it's actually part of the effect right to have to be so so dry and just so so when there is reverb it's intentional it's an intentional choice and then you make a choice to 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 cut it or to build it or to do whatever you're going to do with it reverse it yeah i'm really big on i don't use it at all ever and not intentionally just because i forget I don't know why, I guess I, I forget, I'm about to talk about how much I love it. So I haven't forgotten about it completely. Um, 
I love when you're listening to music and there's like an effective use of silence in a spot. Like, especially when it's like just a tinge longer than you thought it would be. Like, like that's like a, that tease, I guess, is just so uh, wonderful and effective. Yes, that's it. So I'd say and that, that is Hiromeki. Now we get to learn what, what Hiromeki actually is. Uh, Hiromeki is a type of art. Um, the Japanese no. translation is... Damn, it is Japanese. Is actually a splash of inspiration. And it's basically oh. like random blobs, colorful splashes, smears, like... Impressionist is like and impressionist then sort of take like black ink and like draw what you see so it's the same thing as like oh. i don't know kind of like when you're looking at clouds and like seeing finding shapes yeah. but it's like actual art so if you see a blob and you're like well i think it looks like a rabbit and then you draw and like kind of ink in a rabbit over the colorful splotch i feel like i did this in like kindergarten no oh, totally i'm doing it like i did it this week and then i discovered there was a name for it so i was like here we are <laughs> yeah yeah Good. In fact, I, like I so I, I there is a there is a project that we did in kindergarten or preschool where we got like a blob of ink or paint on a piece of paper and we were supposed to blow through a straw mm -hmm. to spread the paint on the page. And then the idea was you're going to do that. You're going to paint, you're going to draw whatever the thing is, except I blew so hard through the straw that I passed out. Oh, no. <laughs> That's the cutest so art story know. ever. And and the thing is that I was so frustrated when I came back that they wouldn't let me finish because I was not done with the with the paint. I did not want to like leave it the way it was. Oh. Yeah. Tragic. What do you think that would be? What would the musical call musical music? musical equivalent of that be? Would it just be like banging out some notes and then being like, how does all this work together? There is a, uh, what's it called? There was a com an experimental music composer <clears throat> who wrote, I, I should preface this by saying in experimental music, you typically don't write music. You sort of like, conceptualize the instructions and then leave it to the performers to interpret them. Um, Candy Apple Revision is the name of, of the thing that I'm thinking of. And basically what Candy Apple Revision was is it was like in the key of G or whatever. And that's literally it. Like it starts with a note and then everybody just plays whatever mm. happens after that note. And then it, finishes when it finishes and that would be the that would be the uh the musical equivalent here mecky I, when i was in college we had um i worked at the audit i mean the auditorium and had to do like you know sound setup all kind of stuff and there was this we we would always have like the music department bring in musicians and it was always very like you know what you would expect at a liberal liberal arts school and you know not not super exciting but somebody brought in this trombone player and she was like, hi, um, I need um, eight speakers. I need eight, like, I need octophonic, an octophonic setup. Um, how many amps do you have? Can we make this happen? And like, for those of us working in the auditorium, we're like, wait, like we, we what? Like we get to do weird, cool stuff? Hell yeah. So she had this deal and uh, so we set up like eight speakers in the the room. We would we did it in a smaller auditorium, which was which was circular shaped, and so there were like two speakers. She was at the front, so really nine sources of sound, and then eight all the way around. And they came off, like we we got enough amps, and they were like all mismatched. It was all like this like conglomerated like duct tape mess, and it came into this board, and it was like careful with that cable, don't wiggle that one. We'll lose those two speakers. I mean, it was like it was barely held together. And then she takes this microphone, she clips it onto her trombone. Uh, and it's like, you know, like the little skinny, like headphone wire. And it's like 200 feet long. And she runs that, like we tape it to the ground. She runs it all the way back to the soundboard where she sets up her computer that has like 
this octopus plug coming out that's supplying the sound for each of these. So she would play and different notes would trigger different things on different speakers. Um, and like she could play like she played an E and it, like this would happen over here and then like this speaker would respond. But um, it was like for this like, and I wish I could I wish I could see it again. I should probably Google it. I bet there's a performance somewhere online. But I actually want to sit in the middle and experience it. Like for, for this like squared in like understanding of like what music was at that point in my life that she was like playing with music, but doing it like in front of a crowd and that there were going to be things that didn't work. And that was just part of the experience was uh, actually more liberating, liberating than I could handle at that point in my life. Now I think I would absolutely love it. But at the time I was just like, this is so fucking weird. And it was, and, um, and I, I, I hope she's still doing it. I'm going to Google it and figure it out afterwards. Cause it, reminds me of, it was of uh, amazing. imaginary landscapes number four, which is a piece by John Cage that was uh, written for, I want to say 12 radios. Uh, and it is actual sheet music and it does have a time signature. Um, but uh, it's obviously like I saw it performed uh, by music students uh, at, at my college. And th they there was a point where they lost they lost where they were in the music. But you can't really see that or hear that because it's just literally like the instructions are like turn the radio to such and such station and hold it there for and like like turning the volume up and down for like um you know uh and and that's it so like wherever you are in the world it's going to sound different and it's always going to be because it's different radio stations different frequencies are in use in that area uh and obviously when it was written uh when uh when john cage wrote it probably there were fewer uh, frequencies that were in use because there are fewer radio stations or had they, they had smaller broadcast areas or whatever. So it would have been a lot more white noise, but now we, we perform it. You're going to hit a lot of different like radio stations. You're going to get in between the radio stations. You're going to have competing things. It's like, it was, it was, it was magical. And there were, there were parts where it worked and you could hear the sound sort of sweeping across from one side to the other. And it was just um, the most amazing thing in the world, just to have this like wave of sound going back and forth between these radios. And yeah, it's, and they're all different types of radios, like boom boxes and like, you know, clock yeah. radios and like everything. Yeah. It was, it's experimental music is fun, man. I had a question, but we don't have enough time. Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at @binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the form on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.